if you were to pause the movie right before it with a person who had never seen it and say, guess what happens? <laughs> guess what happens next? <laughs> <laughs> They'd never they say the right thing. Never they in would a million fucking years. Never in a million years would they guess what the fuck happens in this movie. And I love that about it. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode two of Go Ape. Today we're going to be talking about the first of the ape sequel, Beneath the Planet of the Ape, starring James Franciscus, Charlton Heston, Kim Hunter... James, Gregory, a bunch of other people we don't really care about. Joining me is the guest from the first Go Apes episode, Oliver. Welcome back. Adam, hello. Thank you. I'm so excited. This is my favorite ape sequel, and because you, of that... You have got to be the only person on a planet that thinks that. I, I, could, I could very well be, but you know what? I'm a man of conviction. I love this movie. I, I, there's a lot of people who don't like this movie at all. There's, mm -hmm. In fact, there's a lot of hatred for this movie. And I get it. Particularly oh, I get with it the, too. Let's just kind of dive into this. No spoilers at the beginning, but I kind of want to give some backdrop to this movie because I think if you know the backdrop of this movie, it makes a fuck ton more sense why the movie is the way it is. This movie's the definition of a quickie sequel. Some history with 20th Century Fox. In 1970, they had released three big, giant box office bombs. Uh, two of them were musicals uh, made by the people that made The Sound of Music. And then one of them was one of my favorite films of all time, Torah, 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 about the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor. So they were in desperate needs of money. Planet of the Apes movies were still doing really good. The first one was still doing unbelievably well. I mean, it had a budget of $5.5 million and made $33 million back in 1968. Money. That's a, that's, and that's just in the United States. People were going ape all over the world. So they realized that, yeah, we need a sequel. And so originally they had uh, planned on giving this movie a budget of a, a little under Planet of the Apes, but still in the $5 million range. All of a sudden, overnight, it got cut just before filmmaking, before they began shooting. It got cut, to, it literally got cut in half to $2.5 million. And that explains a lot to me. Another thing, too, that this film does is it brings on writer Paul Dane. And Paul Dane would write the next this movie and the next two sequels, and then he would pen the outline for battle. And Paul Dane is, I think, that unifying force behind the scenes that makes this movie what it is, the film that it is. Because you can even say, like Arthur P. Jacobs, who was the main producer of this movie, of these movies, all the eighth movies, um, he, I can't even say it was him because. Planet of the Apes was actually his B movie. He was just kind yeah. of doing that on the side. His big movie was a movie called Dr. Doolittle, which was a big musical. And guess what? The movie bombed. Well, Dr. Doolittle, not Dr. Doolittle, like, like the dogs and the, and the animals and the. Yes. I like when actually, Robert Downey Jr. fists the elephant. Anybody fist an elephant in that original? Nobody fists, but there were, nobody fisted an elephant, but they did ride a giant <laughs> snail. It was really Paul Dane because, like, if you even look at the production crew of this movie, it was entirely different. A lot of them were from TV, uh, namely the director Franklin J. Schaffner was offered to come back on this film to be the director, and he showed interest because hey, it was a big success. Why not? And why not? I helmed the the first one. I can helm the second one. But he was balls deep in making a little movie called Patton. They decided to go with a director by the name of Ted Post. And Ted Post was a big TV director. He was known for being not overly artistic, known for getting things done on time and on budget and on schedule. A competent director. A Tim you know. story of the day. They couldn't quite figure out what to do with this movie. Because the original idea by was, was that Planet of the Men, which was Charlton Heston does start breeding... A, a new race of humans to combat the apes. And the ending of that film would have been brilliant, admittedly. I don't think the movie would have worked well as a whole, mm -hmm. but the ending of Planet of the Men was... They were at a zoo, and a bunch of these, these humans were laughing at all these apes that now they can't talk, and they're all naked, and they've been reduced to being back in cages. And they come to one orangutan and they're like, say your name, say your name. 
And he goes, my name is Dr. Zayas. And that That's was the brilliant. ending of the film. That was the ending of the film. And I'm like, and I'm like, so all the fears of what Dr. Zayas was saying came true. Uh, and it, it certainly would have been an interesting movie. I, I would love to see kind of like what they did with Rod, Rod Serling's original script for Planet of the Apes, if they made this into a graphic novel, uh, because it would have been very interesting. But eventually they came up with the script that we got. A lot of that had to do with the fact that Charlton Heston did not want to be in this movie. That was right. huge. Like, that was bad. And on top of that, the original producer, the, or the financier, I should say, of the original Planet of the Apes movies, Richard Zanuck, uh, was getting fired by his own father at 20th Century Fox. So nobody wants to make this movie. Charlton Heston doesn't want to be want to make this movie. Richard Zanuck had to personally beg Charlton Heston to to be in the film. And Charlton Heston said, I will only be in this movie if you kill me off in the first scene that I'm in. They come up with a compromise. You appear in one scene in the beginning of the movie, and then you come back at the end. And Charlton Heston said, okay, sure. So then they had to come up with a new character. Who's, who's the story going to tell? Bring in discount Charlton Heston. Yep. James Franciscus. Store. James Franciscus, who is an underrated actor, in my opinion. He was not so much known for his movies, even though he stars in one of my favorite Ray Harryhausen films, The Valley of Guanji. Uh, which is about cowboys and dinosaurs, and it's awesome. He played in a lot of television. In fact, the reason why he agreed to be in this movie is, one, he could show off his physique. He was a rather strong, handsome man, and he wanted to show that off. And two, This is a it was... common thread for, yes. for these apes movies. These dudes yes, want to get naked. Yes. And then on top of that, he said, and I quote, it would be a nice relieving break from my normal television fare. James Franciscus and, and, and Ted Post knew exactly what kind of movie they were making. And they hated Brent. They hated him. Mm. And so apparently they spent a week together and took Paul Dane's script and wrote about 50 pages worth of notes to give back to Paul Dane to make changes for who uh, Brent is as a character. And so then Paul Dane incorporated that and that ended up wound up becoming the final version of the movie the final script for the movie that we got and a lot of the stuff with with Brent Underground in particular is mm -hmm. stuff from James James Franciscus and and Ted Post. Charlton Heston said if only he knew what was coming, he would have been he wouldn't have been so much of a like of a, a dick about not wanting to be in this movie. Uh but hindsight is always twenty twenty because back then franchises weren't a thing. Right. Right. Franchise well, that, that is interesting because that is the building block of the genre that this movie is in, is that these mm -hmm. movies like this get franchised out. In fact, Apes itself is one of the first big science fiction franchises like we talked about last time, the especially only... when it comes to merchandising. That's what I was going to say. The only thing that I think even remotely predates Planet of the Apes is Godzilla. Literally. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that's, and that's literally the Japanese it. love toys. <laughs> but this was even before that. Go Apes, that campaign, and th why my sh the show is called Go Apes, it's an homage to that, wasn't a thing until Conquest. That's when suddenly they started exploding with toys and exploding with this, that, and a whole shit and caboodle. Uh, lunch boxes, thermoses, everything. Everything had apes on it now. But there wasn't th that wasn't there yet. Everybody fucking knew that this was just a quickie sequel that was there to make a quick buck for 20th Century Fox. Some brand recognition. I think the fact that the movie is as good as it is, is a miracle in of itself. Way more of a miracle than the original. You, like, you look at Ted Post, and I, I like Ted Post. I really like one of his movies, Hang Em High with Clint Eastwood. I think it's a genuinely a, a good I movie. I love Hang Em High. Yeah, that's Ted Post. And I think that's a pretty damn good movie. Uh, he then he went on to direct this. I'll say it. I, I think the direction in this movie is a lot. It's a lot kind of like sloppier. I, mm -hmm. I think than it's, than it's not as yep. polished as what Schaffner was as a director, but, or, or even Don Taylor who directed escapes or especially Jay Lee Thompson with conquest. But I will give him this. This movie's got a lot of movement in it. I, I, I can't say he's a bad director at all. I I think he get pulls out some really good performances, particularly with 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 Zayas, 
and Ursus. And there's several people in this movie, including Brent, where I think if you read the script, they're one-dimensional characters and they're almost cardboard cutout characters. But because of the performance that is given, it elevated the characters. And I have that with Brent and Ursus. Jerry Goldsmith couldn't come back. Jerry Goldsmith couldn't mm. come to, back to do the music on this as well because guess what? He was working on Patton uh, and Tora, Tora, Tora. He was a busy man in 1970. Always the way it goes. Without going into any spoilers, your overall thoughts of what I guess is your favorite Apes movie. Anybody who knows me knows that I love a stupid, schlocky, bad movie. It's my favorite thing in the world. And I'm not saying this is a bad movie. This is like Evil Dead 2. This is like Army of Darkness. This is like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. It's good, dumb, B-movie science fiction. And I, I don't know what your definition of spoilers is, so I'm not going to jump into it. But some of the characters that show up here belong in Superman 4. <laughs> some of the things happening here are because I think ideas like these are what this genre is built on because we start with the bad, the silly, the whatever, and then we build on that and we say, okay, how do you legitimize that? I'm not saying beneath the Planet of the Apes is as smart as Planet of the Apes. I'm not saying it's as gut-wrenching as Escape from Planet of the Apes. I'm just saying you can't tell what the hell's going to happen next, and I <laughs> fucking love this movie for I, that. <laughs> yeah, me too. Oliver, exactly the same same reason. I love the sharp right turn this movie takes about halfway through the film. When that happens, I no longer know what's going to happen if for the rest of the movie, to, and I love that. If you were to pause the movie right before it with a person who had never seen it and say... Guess what happens? <laughs> Guess what happens next? <laughs> <laughs> they never they say the right thing. Never they in would, a million fucking years. Never in a million years would they guess what the fuck happens in this movie. And I love that about it. I, I truly do. My overall thoughts is that the first half of this movie is, it's exactly what everyone feared it was going to be. And that is a quick oh, yeah. sequel. The first and half, I'll say it, it, it mm, a yep. little boring, a little boring, a little yeah. slow. Well, well, I, I, I disagree. I think it's boring. Let me, let me say this. I think the first half actually feels rushed. It's a rushed mm. mess of trying to get from point A to point B, action scene, action scene, action scene, point A to point B, and it doesn't bother to, with the exception of Cornelius and Zira, mm -hmm. it doesn't really let us digest what's happening. Right. And because of that, I. A uh, part of me genuinely says I want at least ten more minutes in Ape City of Brent trying to hide or go into what the fuck happened because Ursus is a is a thing because of Taylor in the previous movie. Be we're introduced to the Gorilla General Ursus, who is fucking awesome. I don't care what anyone says, and uh, James Gregory gives such a good performance that he's a one note, one dimensional bad guy. But James Gregory makes him so he, charismatic. You love him. He's your Bond beat him up guy. He's yes. you know the big muscle man that comes to punch Indiana Jones. He's he's that guy. But you know what? He's a damn good version of that guy. Plus the makeup on him is really good too. Like the gorilla makeup on him. Oh yeah, it's really good. I just wanted to know what's going because there's a few lines that get said. We'll get into this in spoilers where it's like they hint at something really good. And something really interesting that's going on in Ape City. Mm -hmm. But because they're trying to do a rehash with a less interesting Taylor, Brent, right. it doesn't come off. It doesn't, it doesn't go there. But then that second half happens, and Oliver, I'm not going to lie, I think the second half of this movie is a masterpiece. Absolutely I mean it. it is. 100%. It is, it is a masterpiece. And I love how it's shot. I love the crazy editing. I think it's acted extremely well. I love some of the dialogue that happens mm -hmm. in that final in that final in that final half. And it's just so fucking weird. It is such a great example of how making things and it's it's why I advocate for this kind of thing in cinema now. I love a silly movie. I love something that's like, yeah, that's over the top, but I haven't seen that before. 
and that's really cool when something gets that over the top and that silly and that weird and those creative juices are flowing they do wind up at a really profound place at the end of this movie and it's cool Mm -hmm. again no spoilers but it's not an ending that people know is coming in apes i know where we're gonna wind up Right. And that's just societal. Mm -hmm. That's how that is. I'm not saying it's a bad twist, but it's a good enough twist that we all know what's going to happen now. Mm -hmm. Um, So you watch that movie different. You're watching it to see, look for hints. You're watching beneath and you're going, what the hell is going on here? You know, acid. I think that I think you feel like you're watching an you're on an acid trip. But that gets you to this place that a it is logical that this world would go this way. And B. (laughs) It it is, a, it's a stunning ending that you wouldn't have got if you didn't let these people just run wild in there. So I guess you're saying yay on the ending because that that was Big my next yay. question. Because I was gonna say are you yay or nay on it, and a lot of people are nay, and I get it. But I'm a I'm I'm very big yay. <laughs> on the I am actually I don't want to spoil, but I have several current day movies. Uh, that that I'm going to be talking about soon that I wish would take some freaking notes from this and end the same way. <laughs> well, this movie subverted everybody's expectations before subverting expectations was a thing. I remember the first time, my mind was blown. This The, the second half of this movie, when watching this for the first time as a kid, and I was sitting there, my parents were with my, my great aunt Ree, uh, they were playing poker in, in the kitchen, right? And I was sitting in my recliner with my blankie, you know, it wasn't when I was fucking old enough that it was my blanket. Mm. And, and I, right. I, you know, I was just watching this. And for I watched this for the first time in her living room. And this movie fucking blew my mind. <laughs> it blew my fucking mind, Oliver. It's insane. <laughs> Even with the historical context in my head of like what early 70s science fiction was like, which was very different than what. It was post right. Star Wars. Uh, it's um, a beloved era for me. Yeah. Even with that in mind, it's still, to me, the ending of Beneath impacted me more as a viewer than the original did. And 100%. I do think part of that, for me at least, is because you know what the end of the original is going to be when you watch okay. it in our lifetime, right? Right. It's not just that we don't know how this movie ends. It's it's that they don't make movies that end like this anymore. <laughs> no, they certainly Where do not. <laughs> the only other experience I've ever had watching a movie like and being this surprised by like a sharp turn is the end of The Departed, where spoilers for a movie that came out in 2007, when DiCaprio gets shot in the face in the elevator. One of the greatest little twists in cinema history is that. And you're sitting there watching it and you go, you can do that? Yeah. You can, and that's what this is. You can do that? (laughs) I mean, you kind of get a little taste of it coming at the very Mm -hmm. beginning with Charlton Heston's character, but you're still like, what? And there's a couple of lines from the apes too that kind of foreshadow that something weird is happening out there in the Forbidden Zone. It's, it's fair to say, too, that Heston is an action hero, right? Mm-hmm. If you go from, from one to two. And Heston being in this movie is marketing, this is our hero, this is our action hero. And if you're a movie with an action hero in it, it stands to reason that the audience believes the hero is going to save the day at the end. And so you are conditioned to believe, oh, no matter what they say and what they threaten, that's what we're afraid of. It's not going to happen because good conquers evil and, and the hero wins. That's what Hollywood has taught us. Um, if there's anything 70s science fiction has taught me, the good guy that. never wins. Yeah, it's not that. <laughs> never wins. This is one of the bleakest movies I've ever seen. <laughs> it's, it, it is. Uh... Again, no spoilers yet. But, oh my and it, God. It's not just... It's not just bleak, but I, I love it because it, it's so effective. It's so great. It's also the kind of ending that a second grader could come up with in the best <laughs> possible way. I, th- I think Ted Post gets a bad rep. Uh, he's not as good as Franklin J. Schaffner. And I, I think out of all the directors that come from the Planet of the Apes, the original five films, he is the, the weakest of the bunch. 
Well, when you say but, he's known as kind of a rough and tumble, he can get the job done. What comes yeah. to my mind now is a Tim Story or a Sean Levy. The studios like these guys, so they get work. Yep. They come in under budget. There's nothing particularly spectacular about their direction as far as style goes. Um, but they're they're effective. Uh Effective That's, is a good word to describe Ted Post. Like, yeah. like he gets the job done, and it's usually done pretty damn competently. Uh, as far as actors selling it, and we'll move off him because we've already talked about him a good amount, but mm-hmm. the fact that Heston did not want to be here, you know. Heston gives a good performance in this movie. He does. That's what I'm saying. And I yeah. believe that speaks to Ted Post being a, a good director because... It takes a good director and a good captain of the ship, first of all, to mold the material to where an actor can be their best in the in the role. So you have a mm-hmm. guy who doesn't want to be there, you mold the story around that. That's being a good director. That's the same as James Gunn saying, oh, Dave Batista can't really emote at this stage in his career. Let's make him, let's make that the character. Charlton Heston is one of the most talented to ever do it. I'm not saying he wouldn't have couldn't have given a good performance in his sleep, but the movie also uses a weakness to its strength, and I think that that's really cool. From what everybody said, including the the girl that played Nova, um, Charlton Heston was pretty vocal about not wanting to be in this movie, but he always showed up on set, on time, and ready to go, and he knew his lines. Mm-hmm. He was a consummate professional. Not and a Brando. I think that, yeah, not a Brando. <laughs> Band-Aids off. Spoilers ahoy. Oh, the monkeys and the people can't get along and they blow up the world. They Adam. blow up the fucking planet. <laughs> <laughs> the last line of this movie is Charlton Heston holding his heart as it's bleeding out. And he <laughs> says, you bloody bastards. And he blows up the fucking planet. Not just detonates a nuke. He blows up and incinerates the entire the earth. earth is and it gone. ends. It ends. In the uh, uh, the ending narration, he the the narrator says, "In the countless billions of stars in our galaxy lies a medium-sized star, and orbiting that star, a green and insignificant planet is now dead. Fades to black. <laughs> silent end credits. That is you the end up of you... your movie." You blew it up and you never even mattered in the first place. Oh my god! And it's the best is that it's so profound, especially to where the world was at the time. So it's, it's a message of of the dangers of our own hubris and where we're yeah. headed. And I I even believe that you know there, there's something to be taken away from that now. Well, the um, the Alpha and Omega bomb was a genuinely big fear in oh, that yeah. era. That we were going to develop a bomb so powerful it will actually incinerate the Earth. And what's yeah. even better is as sophisticated of a fear as it is for a movie that, you know, ultimately a lot of the success boils down to toys. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's when you see a kid playing with action figures. What happens at the end? They destroy the world. Every character you knew and loved, they're dead. Like fucking Nova gets blown away. Uh, and and freaking James Brent, after all the shit that he's been through, he's then shot through the head and then riddled with bullet. He turns into Swiss cheese when the apes start shooting him. Oh, it's and glorious. It's awesome. It's so insane. Zayas has such a clear choice. Taylor is like, er, just help me, Zayas. This is the end of the world. Help me. And instead of helping him, Zayas doubles the fuck down and says man is evil, capable of nothing but destruction, intercut to James Francisca shooting a bunch of apes and the apes destroying everything. (laughs) And I'm like, oh my god, this sucks. (laughs) There is a a real beauty to that this is not ape cinematic universe phase one. You know what I mean? <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> th- this is not teaser for another movie in any way, shape or form. They did not just want like, any more sequels. Just like the first one is not that every ape movie. And I'll even argue and we'll get their escape 
I'll even mm-hmm. argue that because I know people say that's open ended, but I, I disagree. Actually, I think that that still functions as the end. Every Apes movie, the end is supposed to be the end of the franchise because we're not focused on the next thing. And I think that that allowed for such a cool ending to even exist. You could not do this now because the bean counters are sitting there saying, yeah, but what if you make a billion dollars? Don't you want to make $2 billion? Crank out another one. I got to tell you, I wasn't expecting to see a bunch of telepathic mutants nor was I expecting to see that those telepathic mutants pray to a nuclear bomb. The the telepathic uh, mutants is such a them. turn for this fucking thing. They're I so fucking cool. love them. They are Silver Age DC type characters that you mm-hmm. would see in like old Superman serials. I- incredible. And, and, and some the- of their dialogue is fantastic too. There's one scene. He's credited in the end credits as Negro. So I guess he doesn't have a, a name. Yeah, but he's he's the guy that gets Brent and Charlton Heston to fight each other. He has this amazing line that is he delivers it perfectly because of how clinical and cold he says it. Mm-hmm. He says, "Mr. Taylor, Mr. Brent, we are a peaceful people. We do not kill our enemies. We get our enemies to kill each other." And I'm like, that gave me chills. It's cold. I actually was going yeah. to bring up. I love the idea that these. People who pray to a bomb. They are militant people. They believe that they are peaceful. They fully are are committed to that. We don't hurt people. You hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, what what a great concept because that brings up all of these amazing concepts about mind control and what does your body do and who is telling it to do it and what does free will even mean? And again, these are these themes that can only be achieved when you just let the creative team go fucking nuts. The head priest, uh, mm-hmm. who I guess his name is Mandez, who's terrifying. I, I, I don't, all of them are terrifying, but Mandez, uh, there's something about how like somber he looks all the time and how calmly he speaks with that deep, rich voice that he has that makes me go, oh God. I love the sermon that he gives. The ending of the sermon after they reveal that they're mutants, which was an awesome scene. Yes. It's so effective because that was, everyone agreed in the production that that scene was the scene that was going to shock people like the original ending was. Mm. It was going to be that scene. And I think it works. I I genuinely think it works. And I also like that the makeup uh, isn't over the top grotesque. It's just us with our epidermis gone. And I'm like, that right. almost makes it ooh, even that's even, even ickier or grody. Yeah. But he says the ending of his sermon goes like this. It says, may the blessing of the bomb almighty and the fellowship of the holy fallout descend on us all this day and forevermore. Amen. And there's something about the fact that if you look at the, the doors to their church, you see an upside, you see two upside down crosses. That's mm-hmm. fine. And then when you see the bomb for the first time, you realize it looks like an upside down cross. And yeah. I'm like, this is awesome. They are the antithesis to the apes as well. Is that th- these are men worshiping a tech tech. This mm-hmm. is a bomb. They're worshiping and tech. The, and the apes fear tech actively. And I like how the ape uniforms are all really dark. It also helps that the gorillas are the army. So dark. And then you have all of the mutants who are wearing these bright robes these white clean clinical robes which i think contrasts with the nature of radiation and all that Mm -hmm. i absolutely love the contrast even though it is still disturbing watching the apes charge into that underground city and literally massacre everyone (laughs) they come across uh it's it's a flat-out genocide you have zayas screaming this is obscene and beating statues' heads in with the butt of a rifle. Uh, it is magnificent. It is a fun twist that after the apes are the, the across-the-board villain for the entire first movie, barring yeah. Cornelius and, and Zira, um, and, and you are afraid of them in this movie, uh, but when they descend on the fucking mutants... It is like a fuck yeah. 
here come the damn monkeys. Oh, I don't, you see, here's the thing. I didn't get a fuck yeah moment. I was terrified because I think, I think the entire last act is full of some amazing tension. Sure. Uh, and I think that tension stays there to when, from when the, the mutants make, they, they don't just make, this part is genuinely disturbing. They don't just try to control Brent to the point where he tries to physically harm Nova. They mm. try to make him rape her. Right. I'm like, oh, remember this is G? This is rated G. Yeah. And it is one of the dark, uh, not darkest G rated movies. It's one of the darkest movies. Yeah. Like they, they, they do that. And on top of that, so you've got these two armies going up against each other. You have the mutants who are going to blow up the earth. You have the gorillas that they have no idea what the fuck they're doing. And they're just killing everybody and everything because that's what they do. Mm. And then you have our heroes who are trying to stop the bomb from exploding and they're just getting killed. It suddenly goes from being a retelling of the first movie to its own fucking thing. And it's, it's, I, ah, I I just love it. I, I, I I, adore that second half. I think you hit on maybe what, what sells it to me so hard is that it does start as a retelling of the first movie, but it's almost like a lull you into a false sense of security could it be an example of playing with that trope very early on? You know, maybe could, we, could that know. be intentional because that is part of what works about it for me is that it's not just that it's weird at the end. Any movie can be weird all the way through. Uh, recently I saw, I saw the TV glow and I thought that was a movie that really would have benefited from getting weird in the mm-hmm. last 30 minutes rather than being weird the whole time. This movie is you know, it plays it straight for a long time. And then when it starts to get fucking bizarre, it, it's such a turning point in it. And, but I don't think it would work if it was just bizarre from the beginning. I think it almost would be like, well, this isn't really an ape sequel. It kind of shows the mentality how the apes are, they're fucked up. The mutants are fucked up. Ursus's idea when he sees the bomb is to shoot it <laughs> with a machine gun. <laughs> And then when Zaius says, this weapon is made by man, you cannot just shoot it down with a clip of bullets. Ursa says, well, if we can't shoot it down, we'll pull it down. And I think that sort of sums up the, the whole dichotomy of the everything in general. Right. That it's right. nothing but a continuous cycle of destruction. Right. That's, that's all this is. And the cycle is just going to continue and continue and continue, and ultimately the only thing that's going to break that cycle of destruction and hatred is to blow up the is fucking death. planet. Yep. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, that is your theme. So this is a, this is a real hopeful movie. Woof. <laughs> it's a real feel-good, it's a real feel-good, feel-good summer blockbuster right here, yeah. But it's, it's, uh fucking nuts i mean i mean i love that interrogation scene with the mutants too where the mutants are all up on that arch yep and or the council of mutants i don't know what they're called but they're all up on that arch and the woman by the way in that scene uh, her name is natalie trundy that was the actress's mm-hmm. name the woman in that council would go on to play the female doctor on escape and then right. she would also play lisa on conquest of the planet of the apes and beneath the planet of the apes caesar's wife right 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 so she's oh, the only cool. other actor to appear in uh, in in four of the five planet of the apes movie. but i love that scene because the way how james franciscus plays it he'll answer the questions but yet he won't kind of say what they're asking so we're kind of trying to piece it together as well and that little chime that you hear whenever they yep. are talking to him telepathically and the moment he mentions the apes i love how they all start bombarding him at once <laughs> and he ch- and he just can't handle it and he's screaming well you and think about like, how oh. terrifying that would be i can't listen to two songs at the same time guy <laughs> i <laughs> right right it, if if two people speak to me at the same time i'm gonna have a conniption imagine that many people in their main line in your brain, you yeah. know, this is and, body and horror. They're not just, they're not just in, in your brain. It's such a psychological terror too, because they're like, 
the visual, which they then make him think he's seen flames in front of himself. Mm-hmm. And then the psychological in which they like blast a supersonic sound in his head that essentially tries to kill him. It's perceived death is what right. it is. It's none of it's real. It's all an image. And it, I love how it's foreshadowed in the beginning with Charlton Heston because I love how suddenly he sees that wall, that cliff. And he's like, that wasn't there. Yeah. And then he looks to Nova and she, she's looking around too. I love how he goes, no, you see it too. So I'm not going crazy. And I love the logic behind that. Right. Uh, I love. I love the. It's not just that they they rape her and or they have him rape her and they make them fight and all of these you know terrible heinous things. It's the insistence that they are a peaceful evolved species. That to me is what is so terrifying about it. And it's it goes beyond the actions of them doing it. It's the person watching, very matter of factly. This is what we do. This is life. So everything good in which we've talked about with this movie thus far, um, I need to really emphasize is in the second half of the movie. The first half of the movie is where just about all of my problems arise. It feels like when you hit a season of a television show where the whole cast knows that the show should have been over. And you're in that first premiere episode and you're like, uh, like when you go from The Office season five to The Office season six, <laughs> you go, oh, this is not going to be that good. <laughs> right, right. I, I, I suppose so. I, and be, and the, the biggest letdown with the first half of the movie, though, to me, is that they don't bother to kind of expand upon Ape City. They kind of have some inklings to it. Uh, but they don't mm-hmm. go along with it. And that's why I'm saying I really wish we had like at least 10 more minutes in Ape City to kind of flesh out right. the politics of what's happened because we have the rise of General Ursus and the rise of General Ursus is so clearly a reaction to Taylor mm-hmm. that it scared Ape City shitless. And they've called upon a leader and that leader is Ursus, and he's now going to lead an army into the Forbidden Zone. But he says a couple of lines with Zaius that are unbelievably interesting, and I, I wish they played into this more. Because there's a severe hint that Ape City is about to be hit with a bad famine, and that's actually really why Ursus is going into the Forbidden Zone, because Ursus looks at Zaius and goes, what's worse than famine, Doctor? <laughs> and the Doctor says, the unknown. Uh, despite the fact that those ape suits are terrible, uh, why they had yep. to do that in a sauna is beyond me. I, they could have just had it. Or they just could have had it in Zayas's office, and it would have worked just as well. You also see a lot of the in the crowd scene where he's working, where Ursus is working the crowd. A lot of that reduced budget shows itself there because you see a lot of just pullover ape masks that contrast so blatantly with the full makeup. Yep. Yeah, I like the the implications of that. If Ape City is going to be in a famine, we need to expand. Where mm-hmm. to? Because if the humans are prospering out there, then that means we can prosper there too. And that's the whole Possibly better than them. We're more yeah. evolved. You're right. If there are more people like Taylor, which is what it, Zaius is all about. He's afraid of. Yeah. We need to kill him. Right. In the name of God. In the name of... <laughs> this, is, is, this is a holy war. Which is, it is. Which is so funny because you have the mutants who say this is a holy war and then you have the apes that think this is a holy war. In fact, there's a beautiful cross cut too where the sermon with the bomb happens revealing that they're the mutants. The next scene, it's another sermon but with the apes. And that priest so blessing funny. the apes yeah. about to go off to war. And I'm like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> the war yeah. of faith. We're getting uh, heavy. I love the fact that apparently Zaius is so desperate to keep things in order in Ape City that he decides to go to Cornelius and Zira saying, hey, you guys are now the ministers of science. Keep things in order, please, while I'm gone. And that whole dichotomy I find interesting that I just wish the movie played on a little bit more. Right, it's all there. Yeah. And and it's just it's just kind of breezed over. Zayas is awesome in this movie. I think he's awesome from beginning to end in this film. In fact, I think I think he's a better character in this movie than he is in the previous one. Because in the I agree. previous in the previous film he's pretty one dimensional. Effectively yep. so. I'm not 
effectively right. so. Right. He's he, a compelling he works villain. beautifully, yeah. Mm-hmm. But in this film, he's shockingly nuanced in several sequences where I, I, the, the, this mentality of, I don't like what the gorillas are doing, but it's going to happen. It's inevitable. And because it's inevitable, I might as well join them and try to keep things in order as best as I can. The scene where all the apes are hanging upside down, they're bleeding, it's the vision, you see the lawgiver, and lawgiver statues start bleeding. Mm. Again, a G-rated movie. Uh, <laughs> I love Ursus charging. Uh, Ursus, Zeus charging. He says, and I quote, The spirit of the lawgiver is with us. We are still God's chosen. This is a vision, and it is a lie. I love how much oh. religious stuff there is in these movies, and how yeah. much there is saying God made the ape in his image. Because what struck me is I love how their church services use the same logic that ours do, where we mm-hmm. say God made man in his image, you know, but but to them it would be different. And I think there's something interesting about how they've bastardized, like, because they, they've obviously learned religion by, lack of a better term, aping humans, right? Like, right. that's the, the earliest ones. But they've bastardized it to be about them, which means someone back somewhere knows that it's a load of bullshit. Oh, well, the, well they do. Uh, Zaius is, is the right... He's the one that blatantly goes, yeah, the lawgiver, it's all bullshit. Mm. It's all right. bullshit. And we kind of learn a little bit more about that in the next film. But, and... What's scary to me is that the mutants seem to believe what they're doing. Mm. Because to me, what's scarier than somebody doing evil things and gaining power and not believing what he's doing? It's somebody who's doing all of that and actually believes in what he's doing. Yep. Uh, (laughs) And that's what's so cool about the mutants. They think they're peaceful. They think that they're driven by being just. And that's what's so interesting about them. They have they have the main component of a good villain, which is truly in their head. I'm a good guy. I'm a good guy. Yeah. Well, that's that's Zaius too, to to an extent. But it's like his whole thing is that he just doubles down. He has hints that he's going to come around, mm-hmm. and then instead he chooses. to But double he can't. Down. He can't let it go. Yeah, he can't let it go. Nova steals the show in this movie. A hundred percent. Uh, for a character that is somewhat two dimensional in the f- first one, mm-hmm. um, it, it, because she's a primitive savage, that's that's by design, right? Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, this movie, that character is so much more complex, um, it, just in, in what she has to do, and we're we're seeing her as a a human. We see her progression. She can't talk yet, but she's starting to understand. She's like a dog. I hate to say that, right? But it's almost well, like. I'm starting to understand this. Taylor, that scene in the beginning where she where she's sitting with Taylor on the ground and he's you Nova, me Taylor. He's training you know. her dog tricks. Yes. Speak. And she starts understanding because she she goes when when Heston disappears, he goes, Find Zira. If something happens to me, find Zira. And it's almost like she recognized the syllables of that. Yep. And that's what she does. She goes back, she backtracks, and she go, she's and I'm like, oh, I, I love that. At the beginning of the movie, Charlton Heston is teaching her to say his name, Taylor. And she's starting to grasp that his name is Taylor, my name is Nova. What is the only word she mutters in the entire... What's her one and only word? It's Taylor. Yeah. And I love that. Even though it comes off as really hoarse and kind of broken and slurred, I'm like, that's perfect for her first word ever. Well, that's also her connection to humanity in what what she could potentially mm -hmm, be, mm -hmm. you know. And I I love Um, the actress, too. The actress, when when she's seeing Brent and Taylor trying to eviscerate each other, the look on her face is... She recognizes Taylor. She hears Brent say Taylor, and she runs towards that direction, sees Taylor and Brent trying to beat each other up, and she looks so terrified, so frightened like a little girl, and in horror, and she just yells Taylor, and that is enough. 
yep. to break the spell a little bit and get Taylor and Brent to act and kill that mutant. And I love that. And I love the fact that that's her only line. What's kind of cool is this recurring motif of certain characters who should not be talking, talking just one time that has okay. been in all of these eight movies. Uh, first one, of course, being um, Heston speaking mm -hmm. for the first time. This one, it's Nova speaking. And then Escape, I won't go into for the next video, but it's at the end. Um, and even what is the thing that we know about current apes is uh, when they flip it on its head and Caesar talks one time for the right. first time. It's a very cool little recurring thing because you, know, I you never, get the shock I never out of the audience before. every time. I never noticed that before, Oliver. That's a really yeah. good observation. I never, I never really saw it that way before. That's a really good observation. I like that. And then Nova dies. Yep. And but so do all of them. You know? Also, that's the only scene where Taylor actually is seen having any other emotion other than grunting and getting angry. <laughs> is is that scene? Is his scenes with Taylor? Uh, is his scenes with, with Nova? Nova. Yep. And I love how he's so genuinely defeated when she's dead. And like I love how he just goes, We should just let them kill each other. We should just end it all. Well, like, in a Ugh. way it must be a, a realization this is never gonna turn around because that was one of the only good things that came for him in the first film. It was sounds that he like genuinely in his connected life. to her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I mean, again, going back to this is a guy who was more than willing to leave his entire life on, on yeah. Earth. Yeah. For little reason other than, I'm, I'm kind of bored, man. Uh, so, yeah, probably nothing good has ever happened to him. He's, he's alienated by humanity, is why he, he has only ever connected with a primitive human. Yeah. And two monkeys. Yep. And that's it. That goes into the biggest, and I mean the biggest issue with the film this film is so clearly supposed to be taylor's story it needed to be taylor's story and there's definitely drafts of this script that are yes it does it make to you be. wonder could you have aged taylor up and recast no no i, I you think I, you think not it needed to be charlton Heston. Um, i see it's him that blows up the world not brent He's the and hero. We get this really visceral fight between Brent and Taylor in that scene, too, with Nova screaming Taylor. That fight is, oh, my God. Like, they literally look like they're brutal. going at it. They look like they're going, like, really going at it. Like, he's, like, freaking uh, Brent. He's swinging that goddamn <laughs> axe around. And, like, he's actually taking chunks out of the wall and everything. I'm like, oh, my God. And, like, one of the... Uh, James Franciscus gets his like back cut and now he's bleeding mm -hmm. all over the floor and like they're grunting and they're groaning and it's not and it's shot so uncinematically too it's just kind of a handheld camera just kind of following the action and it's not like they're doing over the top punches there's not even really over the top sound it's effects. a very it's a very matter of fact real life kind of fight they're fighting, and I love how animalistic it is, too. It's two yeah. animals fighting in a cage. Yeah. It's a great movie, man. It's a no notes A+. plus. No, some notes. Some but notes. I don't care. It's an A+, plus dog. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, the last thing that I just want to talk about is, is, is Brent himself. Because I think, like, I love how his relationship with Nova is so radically mm. different than Taylor's relationship with Nova. I do think that is one thing they do in the first half that well, I, I genuinely think is good. A, and that is smart because this character, we already called him Dollar Store Taylor. Yeah. If this was every beat the same, I think this is a much worse received movie. Well, I than like how it's already there. He doesn't care about Nova. He just sees right. her as a means to finding Taylor because that's the whole reason why he's there. He's there to supposedly find and rescue Taylor. But he perhaps also doesn't understand the total lack and loss of humanity like Taylor did when yes. he met Nova. I, I, so I think that that's she what means a different at. thing to him. Because, you know, that captain of the ship, mm -hmm. right, that goes blind and then he ends up dying yep. in the beginning. It's quite clear Brent cares about him. Right. And that's not Taylor. 
Taylor Taylor did not give two shits about Landon or the other guy or even that girl. Nope. nope. Not until it was foreshadowing what was going to happen to him. Yes. But I like I like how the only scene where he really genuinely cares about it is that he's shocked. And I think that goes into his humanity, too. He can't believe he just tried to rape her. Right. And like, I love that scene. And she can't even look at him because of it. His reaction to discovering that this is Earth is also different than Taylor's. Well, Taylor's was, he exploded with anger and sadness. What I like about Brent's is Brent is very quiet about it. He almost starts hyperventilating as he starts really piecing it together. And you see him shaking. And he never yells, particularly it's in It's just this, not Heston. It's just not Heston, yeah. It needed to be Heston. Right. Story-wise, it's not right. Right. And you didn't get a powerhouse. You Maybe you could save it by getting... Which was real world was not going to happen because the budget was cut. You possibly could save this by not having Heston, but you get a bigger star in there. That's the only pie in the sky thing that you could do. And then the script is written around that person and that person is Taylor. Yes. And then you do a bond thing with it and you just, it's a recast dog. What do you, you know, you cannot recast Heston with a lesser famous, lesser talented actor. So it has to be a different character. And then you have to have Heston in the movie, but he doesn't want to do it. He's only going to be in the end, but also that, has a connotation over the movie right off the bat. I think that perhaps could sour an audience is that, oh, the guy that I'm here to see is gone. And I even think we're yeah. going through a similar thing now. It's just that we've gone from Andy Serkis to Kevin Durant being the star of Apes. And I do think you miss Andy Serkis in the same way that you miss Heston for what it's worth. Um, Although I do think different situation, Kingdom is still a very competent movie all the way through. Um, but it is interesting how history repeats. Uh, I wish I could have talked about Ursus more, just because that freaking the only good human is a dead human. Will always. I mean, that's that's a classic, man. That's, that is um, that is a classic. <laughs> and you know what's when, funny too? A lot of stuff that you see when you type up "Go Ape" or "Planet of the Apes." I love how. Yep. A lot of what you see is not from the first movie. It's from this movie. It's uh, yeah. like Ursus comes up a lot. Some, well, this some of movie the... is very full of like images that, that will stick with you. And, and I think part of the problem that the first movie has with that is not that it doesn't have images that stick with you. It's actually the opposite. It's that there's one image in that movie that sticks with you more than everything else. Yes. And so I think yeah. people overlook things like the doll and the writing on the floor. And, and thank you for calling me Taylor because they only remember the Statue of Liberty. This movie, if you remember it, you remember a bunch of things. Oh, I remember a bunch of things. All right. I um, <laughs> oh, I remember. I love it. You know, as all the shit that I'm bitching about within the first first half of this movie and some of the blaring glaring flaws, the second half is so batshit insane, it's worth the wait. I, I, 100%. Yeah, I may be exaggerating with my A+, but I don't <laughs> think it's lower than an I don't think it's lower than an A- minus at all. Um I, I can't, yeah. I love this movie. I well on a technical level, maybe not the best apes movie. It is my favorite one. And you know what? I just I love crazy shit, man. I love crazy movies, and this is one of them. My friend Sean was like, "I really did not like Beneath. I hated Beneath." And I'm like, <laughs> "Beneath is bonkers. I love Be how bonkers." Beneath it is, is the one, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, Oliver, thank you so much for joining. Uh, why don't you pimp yourself out? Uh, where where can people find yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, man. Uh, other productions and media on YouTube. Uh, check out my documentary series, Oliver the Ricketts American Genius, where we talk about everything from fast food to uh, little everyday curiosities. Uh, recently, I went on a bike ride and tried every Zippy Cooler, which is a cocktail exclusive to Long Island, at every Long Island beach bar, including Gilgo Beach, which gets a nice little spotlight in there. Also, if you like me talking about movies, I am doing a lot of that over on the Designing Hollywood YouTube channel, uh, where we even talked about one apes film, uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes. So all that stuff, TikTok, uh, Instagram, 
follow me. I'm around, and uh, I appreciate you. The links for them are, are in the description. All of my social media is in the description below. And make sure to tune in next week for episode three of Go Ape, where we talk about the sequel that could. Well, we'll see you there, ladies and gentlemen, and take care.